know there's a lot going on in that scene. And I would imagine some of you are have no idea what's going on in that scene. And the rest of you would rather just keep playing and you just go back down and you just keep watching the movie. But I love that scene for a number of reasons. Uh, but the main reason is this feeling that Sam's character has as he's chasing after his friend. As this feeling of being left behind. You ever felt left behind before? You ever felt left behind when you just have like, somebody who's going to do something and you're just like, I want to go do that so bad. Did you get left behind? Have you ever been on the sidelines of a game or an event and you want to be in the game? Or almost worse, you were on the bench. It's almost worse to be on the bench than on the sidelines. You can't even see. You're like trying to look over everybody to see the game. And you just want to be in the game. You know what I'm talking about? Well, if you've ever felt that before, I want you to hold on to that thought for a minute because we're going to come back to it in just a second, that feeling of being left behind. Uh, but what I want to do first is review where you've all been this last month. And that is in uh, the Origin series. I mean, you remember the Origin series? Three of you, that's great. Okay, <laughs> well, we're going to do a little review because in that series, there are a couple of different speakers, I think Keenan and Ben and Rocky shared, and they shared something that was absolutely critical. And it may be something that doesn't fully resonate with you now, but I guarantee it will at some point. And it's this right here. It is our purpose. This was the driving focus of the whole series, is talking about our purpose. Wouldn't it be great to know what your purpose is in life? Well, I'm about to share it with you. And it's already been shared with you, but if you could only hold on to it, it would change your life. This is the purpose. Our purpose is to partner with God to spread His goodness throughout the world. It's that simple. It's to partner with God to spread His goodness throughout the world. And so tonight, I want to talk to you about this idea of, of God's purpose and how we fit into that. Because there's a part of me that just thinks, if God is on a mission to spread His goodness throughout the world, if He's on a mission to bring the world back to the way he intended it to be. And he's looking for partners to do that with him. I want to be one of those partners. I don't want to be left behind. So the big question tonight is, what kind of partner is God looking for? That's the big question that we're going to open up with tonight and that we're going to talk about in the rest of this series. Well, the good news is, is that we can know about what God's purpose is uh, we can know about how we fit into that purpose, and we can know what kind of partner God's looking for. Because in the story, his unfolding story, that's the name of this series, is his unfolding story. Is in that story, there are these big landmark partnerships that we can learn from. These big landmark partnerships that stagger throughout his story. And the first one begins with Abraham. And essentially what this partnership looks like um, is God and an individual are joined together to spread his goodness throughout the world. And Abraham's the first one. And so we're going to talk about why he chose Abraham. And what he calls these partnerships is covenants. So when you read in the Bible, it's called covenants. And uh, covenants is really kind of a big concept. In fact, you really can't understand the Bible without understanding what a covenant is. And we're going to talk about that both tonight and this upcoming message series. But the only thing you really need to know right now is that a covenant is a partnership. A partnership between God and his people. And Abraham was the first one. And God came to Abraham. Now, think about this. Now, we don't hear God speak audibly. But God spoke audibly once upon a time. And this is what he said to Abraham. This is the first words out of his mouth. This is the first time Abraham had ever heard him speak. He said this. Uh, the Lord said, said to Abraham. He ends up changing his name later. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I'll show you. Now, you may have read this before. You may have opened the Bible and read this before, and it's really confusing. I would imagine Abraham was really confused when he heard this. What do you mean? Leave my country. Leave the language. I want you to leave the language that you know. I want you to leave your people. I want you to leave the culture that you know, that you felt comfortable with. That's easy. And I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to leave the people that you love. And I want to go where? To a place I want to show you. And Abraham had to be sitting there thinking, what in the world am I doing? God says this, I will make you into a great nation there. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. Wouldn't it be awesome if God made you that promise? And I would imagine Abraham sitting there saying, Well, great. That's awesome. Thanks. But why me? 
and God goes on. He says this, and all peoples, Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's why. All people. This is the point of the partnership that we're going to set up. Is that all people on earth will be blessed through you? And so we're asking this question: Is what kind of partner is God looking for? And we're realizing that this first landmark covenant, this big covenant that God's making with someone, is Abraham. And so we want to find out. And I'm sure Abraham wanted to find out himself. <laughs> Why did God choose to partner with Abraham? Why did God choose to partner with Abraham specifically? Well. You can understand why God chose to partner with Abraham. In fact, you can understand what kind of partner he's looking for now by understanding the story of, of Abraham when it's set against the backdrop of the stories leading up to his story. Okay, so there's a couple stories before him. You probably remember some of them. You probably thought some of them uh, early on. And these are the stories of Adam and Eve, Cain, and Noah. There's a couple other little ones squeezed in there. But we're going to talk about Adam and Eve, Cain, and Noah. And we're going to talk about them in light of the story of Abraham. Are you with me? Great. Adam and Eve came Noah versus Abraham. Here we go. The first is the story of Adam and Eve. Now you remember this, and I bet many of you, your parents started reading this story when you were just a little kid. And it's the story, it's basically like the second story of the Bible. God creates the world, then he creates man, and then he takes a rib out of Abraham's side. It's kind of weird. You're like, what's going on with that? And then he forms this woman, and Adam's like, this is awesome. That's really great. Adam and Eve, I, I, you know, Adam is like thrilled that God has taken a rib from him. He loves this woman. It's so great. And he gives him one rule and says, don't eat from this tree. All the other trees you can eat, you can name the animals, whatever you name them, but don't eat from this tree. And of course, they eat from the tree. And God comes to him and he says, Adam, <laughs> what did you do? And this is Adam's response. He says, uh, the woman, you know, you remember her? Okay, well, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So what's Adam doing right here? He's blaming it on the woman. Classic. Mm -hmm. and, and what he's saying even more than this, and try to imagine saying something like this to God. Uh, the woman that you bought, so I'm, it's kind of her fault. And you know what, God, you put her here with me, so it's kind of your fault too. Can you imagine saying that to God? It's somebody else's fault, and if you think about it, it's you too. You know, you should have chosen another rib because uh, she kind of screwed this whole thing up. And God turns and he looks at the woman. And this is and God says, uh, God says, uh, what is this you have done? And what's her response? Her response is, uh, the serpent that you created, uh, this little snake that nobody likes. Look, nobody likes snakes, God. Adam doesn't like them. I don't like them. The other animals don't like them. Nobody likes them. He just comes walk in here, and he deceived me. I, God, why did you create these awful little things? And what's she doing? She's passing the responsibility off of her and on to something else. Adam passes the responsibility to Eve. Eve passes the responsibility to the snake. And, and the next um, idea that I want you to get is how Abraham responds to the command that God gave him. Adam and Eve got this command, don't eat from this tree. And that's pretty simple. And Abraham got the command to go to a land that I will show you. And you know how Abraham responded to that? It says this, this is Genesis chapter 12. So Abraham went. That's just about it. Abraham went. And why? Because God had told him to. Here's the point. Here's the point. Abraham took personal responsibility to answer God's call where Adam and Eve had denied it. Are you with me? Abraham took personal responsibility where Adam and Eve had denied it. The next story we need to look at is the story of Cain. This is the story of the very first little baby that's been born. Adam and Eve have a son, and they're so excited about him. They're hoping that maybe he might be the savior of the world. They're real excited. And then they have another baby. Who remembers the other name of the other baby? Abel. So we have the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel just didn't really like each other. They kind of grew up a little bit, and each was given, you know, Cain was given one task. I want you to look after the, the uh, crops. And Abel, I want you to look after the livestock. And God came, and he's like looking at the offerings that they're bringing to him. And he's patting Abel on the back. He's saying, Abel, way to go. You're awesome. You're doing this good thing. You're offering me your first fruit. You're giving me the, this first little beautiful little lambs. 
you know, you're not keeping the best for yourself. You're offering to me. I love it. And do you remember what he says to Cain? And Cain can't stand it. Cain's, Cain's looking for that motivation. God comes to him and says, look, you know what to do. Like, come bring me the first of what you've got. Bring me your best. Don't hold that back. Don't give me your leftovers. And Cain's frustrated. And instead of actually responding to God's call, he takes it out on his brother. Now, I know none of you have done that before, but it, it's actually a pretty terrifying thing because it didn't start with him killing him. That's where it ended up. It started with a little argument. It started with a little complaining. And that's sometimes why your parents say, hey, knock it off. Because if sometimes you have a little sharp object, you might actually go there. And so God comes to Cain and he says this. He says, uh, hey, Cain, where's your brother? And Cain responds, I don't know. <laughs> he denies personal responsibility. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. And then he has this. He says, am I my brother's keeper? You know, is this a zoo where, you know, I just got all these little siblings. I'm supposed to look at it. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to keep up with him? And then we look at how Abraham responds. So when God told Abraham to leave his family and to go to a land he would show him, he had a little nephew that tagged along with him. His name was Lot. And Lot kind of went with him wherever he went. And they started growing and God was blessing them. And Lot's herds and his, his people were growing and Abraham's herds and their people were growing. And then they started arguing a little bit. And it would be easy to be like, dude, Abraham, Abraham's sitting there looking at Lot. Lot, why did you come with me to begin with? Look, this is like my blessing. This is like my calling from God. You're tagging along. What's the deal? You would expect him to respond that way, except he responds differently. And this is what he says. So Abraham turns to Lot and he says, well, let's not have any quarreling between you and uh, me. Let's not have any quarreling between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. Let's not have any, let's not argue. Why? What's the reason? For we are brothers. We are brothers. And here's the point. Abraham took relational responsibility where Cain had denied it. Cain failed the test of taking personal responsibility, and he failed the test of taking relational responsibility. And Abraham passed both. That's part of the reason that God chose Abraham for this first big landmark covenant, this first big partnership. And then the last story, and this is actually kind of my favorite, because you, you kind of know those pretty well, right? This is the story of Noah versus Abraham, all right? This is the story of Noah. You remember Noah, you know, you probably had a little toy that had like two little sheep and two little giraffes and two little elephants, and you could like, you know, hop them on there, and be like, oh, this is so great, there's a rainbow in the sky, and everything's so good, the Bible's so nice. <laughs> but here's the thing, everybody died. Everybody died. Because the world was so, so bad. But right before this flood, God comes to Noah and says this. I am going to put an end to all people. I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. Everybody's bad. And all their thinking is only evil all the time. And I can only imagine what it was like for Noah to hear this. Like, everybody's going to die. Yeah, everybody's going to die. And God tells him again, he's actually wanting to make sure Noah's paying attention. So he says, hey, hey Noah, Noah, I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And you kind of wonder, well, why does he come to Noah and say, I'm going to kill everybody and they're going to die. And then he says it again. In fact, he says it a third time. Do you remember how Noah responded? Do you remember what Noah said? You don't because Noah didn't say anything. He didn't say anything at all. And you might not think that's weird because you might think, well, the whole world's bad. I don't know what I would have said to God either if he came and said, I'm going to send a flood and it's going to kill everybody. And, you know, Noah and you and your family, you're going to get to live and you're going to get to go on. I'm going to start a whole new world. You're going to be the mayor, okay? And you're going to be the one that's going to be, you know, like the father. You're going to be like the new Adam and your wife's going to be the new Eve. And y'all are going to start all over. Because the world's so bad. And Noah probably looked around and he thought, it is really bad. What am I supposed to say? It's really bad. I go into town. You know, people are trying to hurt me. They're trying to hurt my family. I, I don't even go into town anymore. You're right, God. I, I don't blame you. But there's a similar story where God comes to Abraham and he says something 
uh, very similar. In fact, God's about to destroy another group of people. And you're like, what's up with God destroying people? And it doesn't sound like the God that I know. It doesn't sound like Jesus. And here's the thing. If you're familiar with cancer, are you familiar with cancer? My mom has cancer. I'm pretty familiar with cancer. A good friend of mine just finished chemo after six months. And cancer is interesting because there's different types of cancer. And there's different stages of cancer. There's really four stages. And when you get to the fourth stage, it means that cancer has spread throughout your whole body. And it can be really, really painful. And if it spreads throughout your whole body, the probability of you continuing to live is pretty low. Stage four cancer, it's a bad thing. And so God, like a physician, coming to a world that was in stage four cancer and saying, I've got to wipe this clean. We've got to hit this with a chemo like the world's never seen and start completely over. But it was a little bit different with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, this place that God was about to destroy. And he comes to Abraham, and he's having this conversation with them. And Sodom and Gomorrah is a little bit different. He's about to destroy them. Sodom and Gomorrah is like a stage three cancer. It's a cancer that is going to destroy whatever's around it, but it hasn't yet spread. And so God's going to come in like a skilled surgeon and remove that cancer so that it doesn't spread, so that it actually doesn't continue to harm itself. And then God asks an interesting question. He doesn't ask it of Abraham. He actually asks it of himself. He says this, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Now, this is the God of the universe, right? This is the God who knows all things. So why would a God who knows all things ask himself a question? Why would a God who knows all things ask himself a question? And the answer is this. He wanted Abraham to respond to it. God asked him the question, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I'm going to go through with it. Should I even let him know? You know, I let Noah know three different times what I was about to do, and he didn't say anything. Should I even say anything to Abraham? Should I even say anything? But then he decides to say it to him. And here's, here's Abraham's response. Abraham says this. Yeah, wait, hang on, God. What if there's 50 righteous people in the city? Would, would you destroy them? I mean, can you imagine negotiating with God? I mean, he knows everything, and he's all in control, and Abraham has left everything he knows to go and follow this God, and now we have Abraham who's actually questioning whether God's, you know, even all there. Well, wait, hang on, hang on. What if there's 50 righteous people in the city? Would you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? He goes in, he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked just alike. Far be it from you. And then he adds this, and it's just hard for me to even imagine. He says, will not the judge, will not the judge of the earth do right? You're supposed to judge everyone, and now you're not doing right? Far be it from you. This is the first time a man a mere man has challenged the God of the universe. And God asks himself this question, should I even reveal what I'm about to do to Abraham? And this is the response he gets, and God loves it. God absolutely loves it. In fact, when we see later in the story, next week we're going to talk about Moses. And Moses does a similar thing where God gets frustrated with the people who had failed again. And he says, I am going to start over with you, Moses. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses goes, one, he says, if you're going to do that, then you may as well go ahead and block me out of your book. You see, here's the thing. God loves those who argue for the sake and the well-being of other people. And we ask this question, why did God choose to partner with Abraham? And here, here's the answer. Abraham took responsibility where others had failed. Abraham took responsibility where others had failed. It's actually that simple. And it seems like a big deal, but it's, it's really not. It's, it's actually really, really small. It's actually a very easy thing to do. You can do it right now. And if you wanted to be God's partner, Kenny, you were baptized last week, right? 
and you chose to follow God and to be his partner and spread goodness throughout the whole world. You know this? It, you can only be the partner that God wants you to be when you reject what's easy and take responsibility. You like that little run? You can only be the partner God wants you to be when you reject what's easy and take responsibility. And last week, Tammy made a decision. She made a promise. Just like Sam that earlier, she made a promise. I'm going to follow you. Tammy didn't want to sit on the bench. Tammy didn't want to sit on the sidelines. And some of you have made a similar promise. You want to be a partner. Well, you, you know what? If you want to be a partner, you have to reject what's easy and start taking responsibility. You have to start that. And here's the thing. In your life, you're going to come up with a lot of choices. There's going to be a lot of forks in the road where you're going to make one decision and it's going to lead you somewhere and you're going to make another decision and it's going to lead you somewhere. And one of these choices is going to lead you to personal comfort and the other choice is going to lead you to personal fulfillment. Because there's going to be times when it's easier to lie than to tell the truth. And you know that. And there's going to be times when it's easier to make fun of a friend than to be laughed at yourself. I actually heard of a middle schooler recently that actually surprised me. He transferred to a new school. He had a friend from church who was there with him. And to try to fit in with all the other cool people, he started making fun of his own friend just so he could fit in. You know people like that? Look, there's going to be times where it's easier to look the other way than to speak up. But if you want to be God's partner, you have to start taking responsibility. You have to reject what's easy and choose a path of personal fulfillment. In fact, Jesus raises the stakes even higher. In Luke chapter 12, he tells this parable. This is a parable about a manager. And it causes everybody to start shifting uncomfortably in their seats. In fact, halfway through the parable, one of his own disciples interrupts him and he says, Hey, Rabbi, uh, is this parable... You know, like for us, or is it for everybody else? <laughs> and Jesus says this. He says, look, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And then he goes on. He says, I want to make sure you got this. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more is going to be asked. You know something? I don't know all of you personally, but you know what I know? I know that you've been given much. I know that many of you have been entrusted with much. I know your families. And I know that you've been given much. And you know what Jesus says? A lot's going to be expected of you. Jesus is expecting you to take responsibility. He wants you to be the partner that he needs to spread his goodness throughout the world. And it starts with rejecting what's easy. And so you may be sitting here and you're thinking, I'm not sure where to start. That's exactly the question that I want to ask you. That's the question I want you to ask yourself. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself. Where do I need to start taking responsibility? Where do I need to start taking responsibility? And it may be at home, and it may be with your siblings, and it may be with your parents, and it may be at school. And you may be sitting there and you're thinking, I'm not sure really where to start. And so I want to give you one more clarifying question. And this is the question that, man, it clarifies it for me. On the days where I just want to pursue personal comfort, on the days where it looks so much easier to pursue what's good for me, on the days where I'm not really sure if I want to be God's partner really, not, not like really, yeah, I want to be a Christian. I want to wear the shirt. I want to wear the jersey. I'm okay sitting on the bench. On the days where I'm okay actually just being a spectator and sitting on the sideline, on the days where I'm good actually passing up and saying, like, I haven't been given a whole lot, so I'm probably not expected to get a whole lot in return, is this question that drives me. So this question I want you to ask yourself. Who needs me to start taking responsibility? Who's counting on me to take responsibility? Who needs me to to speak up for them? Who needs me to be their friend? Who needs me to tell the truth? Otherwise, they'll get hurt. Who needs you to start taking responsibility? I hope you'll ask that question, and I hope that you'll come back next week as we're going to talk about the next big landmark partnership.
all begins with understanding responsibility. Your partnership with God begins with your taking responsibility. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for the, uh, the men and the women that are in this room. I thank you for those who are sitting here tonight and they're actually wondering. Maybe you have given them more than they expected. Maybe you've given them more than they thought. And I pray that you will actually stir within them this driving, nagging, just uh, won't quit, um, intense uh, desire to know have you chosen them to be their partner? And I know the answer to that, and I hope that you'll make that clear to them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.